This weekend, I'd like to wrap up a series of messages I began a couple months ago (laughs) called The Grace Place. So I'd like you to turn in your Bible to Mark 12, 30. We're going to try to put a cherry on top of this. I talked about grace uh, being a very important part of our story here, and it really is. Uh, I don't think we can do what God's called us to do here without grace, uh, grace towards people. Uh, I I don't even think we can have relationships with each other without grace, uh, much less accomplish a great mission together. So grace is very important. And and this is the last weekend of um, 2012. It's been an interesting year, to say the least. There's been a lot happen. This was an election year, so even just politically, you know, it, it was a busy year that that way. But even around here, um, a lot happened this year. And I believe that God has prepared the way uh, for us to do some awesome work and to make a major difference, not just in Skagit County, but around the world. One of the, one of the groups that we have kind of taken on as a project are, are, are the Christ the Kingers in Pakistan. And we support them monthly. And we also have occasionally uh, raised money for different projects over there. Had an interesting development just recently where one of our pastors in Pakistan uh, was invited into a Muslim, I don't know, I don't think it's called a seminary, but it's basically a seminary where they're raising up Muslim leaders in Pakistan. And he was invited to come in and speak to the group, and he brought with him a book that I had written that they translated in, into their language. And the men there were so enamored with that, they said, we want to meet this author. And so I was given an invitation, and I don't know if I'm going to take it or not, I'm praying about it, to go to Pakistan to basically speak to Muslim leaders, young Muslim leaders. So God's got some interesting things, I think, in store for us as a group. I want to get ready for that. You also look back at a year and you count up your losses, and as a country we do this. One of the artists that, that we lost this last year, who was taken uh, far too soon, was Whitney Houston. From my perspective, when her voice was right and when she was right, she was the best ever. There was a song that, that she popularized called The Greatest Love of All. She wasn't the first one to sing it. She was just the best one to sing it. But the song goes like this. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us how we used to be. Everybody's searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I never found anyone to fulfill my needs. A lonely place to be. So I learned to depend on me. I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadows. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I live as I believe. No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity. Because the greatest love of all is happening to me. I found the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself, it is the greatest love of all. I think we can all agree with some of the things in this song, like children are the future, <laughs> they, they, they got to be taught well, they need someone to look up to. When the song gets into the business of loving yourself, well, I don't think that the greatest love of all is self-love. On the other hand, it's in the top three. Jesus said, and if you listen carefully to what he said in Mark 12, 30 and 31, he said there's three objects of our love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Learning to love yourself, it might not be the greatest love of all, but it's a very important love. Jesus says, you want me to boil it down? We have to love. We have to love our neighbor. We have to love God. We have to love ourselves. When a religious scholar came to Jesus trying to test him, 
he asked Jesus, you know, what do I got to do to have eternal life? And Jesus turned it back on him. What do you think you got to do? And evidently he was a good student because he recited this very thing. He says, well, I got to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, and I need to love my neighbor as I love myself. And Jesus said, well put. Now, some of us want to think that what Jesus should have said is, no, 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 you got that last part wrong. Love God, love your neighbor, don't love yourself. But what Jesus said was, you got it right. That's it. Two months ago, right as I was talking about grace, God was revealing something to me about myself. I came to a startling conclusion that I don't love my neighbor as myself. That's not to say I don't love, it's not to say that I don't love my neighbor. It's to say I don't love my neighbor as myself, I love my neighbor more. And and God revealed this to me when I went away on a retreat in October. You know, we all look back on the past year, what did God do for us? How did He lead us? What did He reveal to us? And this is probably the big thing for me this last year. A number of years ago, In Southern California, there were a group of men who got together, and this was 15 years ago. There was a man, I think at that time, he was probably about my age, and he was thinking about all the men who had been a part of his life through the years and wondering where they are now. You know, the best man in his wedding, the the guy who lived across the hall in the dorm, you know, guys he played on the high school basketball team with. He's like, I wonder where these guys are now. And he did something pretty dramatic. He went out into the desert of California, rented a condo for a week, and invited these different guys who had been a part of his life at different times to come together. They called it the Desert Fathers because they all came to the desert. They were all fathers at that point. And they didn't have much of an agenda, but they took half an hour apiece and said, hey, just give us the story. Where have you been since we last saw each other? And these guys unpacked their stories. And then the other guys would ask questions about that and occasionally gently speak into it, but mainly pray for each other. And it's such a powerful experience that from that group have branched off other groups. Over 200 men have now done one of these things, including me now. In October, I was invited... I only knew the person who had invited me. The other six guys who were in the room never met before. And it came time for me to tell my story, and and I guess I hadn't done it in a long time because I was surprising myself as I'm telling my story. I'm telling my story about how, you know, I'd been a pastor and had stepped down from that, a broken guy and determined I'd never pastor again. And I came to this church in Bellingham called Christ the King Community Church. And they asked me to be a pastor again. I told them, no, definitely not. And they said, well, what if you did it part-time? I said, no. What if you did it temporarily, just for six months? I said, no. But eventually, I came around to say yes. And then I talked about how I eventually became a full-time pastor there. and, And then this group of people in Skagit County came together, 134 people in 1999 at the Elks Lodge. And over the next few weeks, that group grew to over 200 people. And I went to the pastor in Bellingham. I said, we've got to find a pastor for these people. And, and he said, you're the guy. I said, I'm the guy? I said, no, 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 I'm not the guy. But then it was obvious that God was saying, no, you're the guy. And then the Christ the King story started going into other communities and other counties and other states and other countries. And all the way along, there are skid marks. My heels dug in going, no God, you're not going to do this to me. No God, this is not where I'm going. And I realized that I'd been a reticent, hesitant, reluctant leader. And then God absolutely killed me. Because... Right before this retreat, I had gone to Korea. And I think I mentioned to you how I had this huge response from pastors in Korea. And I remember saying to God exactly these words, God, you are killing me. You're killing me. What I realized is I was telling my story to these men 
they didn't say anything back. It was just as I was unveiling it, it was becoming clear to me, I don't have the same opinion about me that God has about me. Like God feels a certain way about me, and I'm not in alignment with that. And right at that time, I'm teaching about grace, and I'm realizing, you know, I have grace for other people. I don't have grace for myself. I think there's a couple ways that we can be disobedient <laughs> to this command where, where he says, love your neighbor as yourself. One form of disobedience is loving ourselves more than our neighbor. And, and we're all familiar with it. It's called selfishness. And selfishness is an obsession with self that excludes others. It does damage to everybody. But when we just say, no, this is about me now. I don't care about other people. That obviously does tremendous damage. Philippians 2, 4 Paul says, do not merely look after your own interests. And the key adverb there is merely. We do have to look after our own interests, but don't merely look after your own interests. It can't just be about you. On the other hand, there's a danger in loving our neighbor more than ourselves, a form of selflessness that's not healthy either. Because Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. You don't love your neighbor more than yourself, but you don't love your neighbor less than yourself. You love yourself like you love anybody, and you love anybody like you love yourself. This has to go together. And so, your neighbor is to be loved by you, and you are to be loved by you. While Jesus speaks of self-love last, I think he speaks of it as being foundational to other love. We cannot effectively love our neighbor if we can't first love ourselves. I don't know if you've ever flown on a, on a, on a flight where they give the instructions, the safety instructions, in case we lose cabin pressure, you're going to see these masks drop from the ceiling. If you're traveling with a young one, they say, put your own mask on first, then assist your child. Because the temptation immediately for any parent would be, okay, I've got to get the mask on you. But the danger in that is while you're getting the mask on them, you might blank out, and now you're both in trouble. And so the sequence is very important. Get your own mask on first. Studies of criminal behavior you know, arrive at this same conclusion. If we don't love ourselves, it's going to be hard to love others. And the kind of people that they've researched who, who become criminals of the worst kind, you know, the rapists, the, the violent, uh, the murderers, almost without exception, these are people who've been treated so badly in life that they came to the conclusion, I'm not worthy of love. And it's out of that, despising themselves at some deep, you know, profound level of the soul that they lash out in hatred, they kill, they abuse, they destroy. What's in you comes out of you. And this is true of hatred. It's also true of love. And what Jesus is saying is, you've got to make sure it's in you. You've got to make sure some love is directed your way. To have love in your heart, you have to have love in your heart. You say, well, isn't it somebody else's job to love me? And I'd say, yeah, it is. But don't buy into the lie that if I do so much for other people, that eventually they'll love me back. Don't buy into that. It's kind of like the waitress you know, who's bringing the water and, and dreaming of the day when the table says, you know, you've brought us so much water, why don't you sit down and have a drink? It's not going to happen. And while it's true that others need to love you, you don't want to leave being loved to chance. Now, God loves you. That's not up to chance. But you need to agree with Him. So now there's two. There's this principle in Scripture about there being at least two witnesses. That this confirms. And you need to align your thoughts about you with His thoughts about you. You need to think the same way about you that He does. You know, Jesus modeled, and the Bible teaches a healthy self-care. And what do I mean by that? You're obviously going to be concerned about others, but you're also to be concerned about yourself. In Galatians 6, it talks about bearing your own burden, and also talks about bearing one another's burdens. It's a both and. But if you've ever gone camping, you know that 
many times when you go camping, you have your own backpack. I mean, you have all the other stuff that we're going to share together and divvy up, but then you have your own backpack to it. What goes in your backpack for your life? First of all, I'd say it's things like thoughts and, and attitudes and your opinion, your beliefs, your, your needs, your choices, your values, your time, your behavior, your health, your resources, your feelings. All of this is yours on this journey. And you've got to care for it. You have to take care of it. You can't expect others to take care of that stuff. That's your stuff. And we need to treat others in the same way we would treat ourselves. Or treat ourselves in the same way that we would treat others. I think of our mission statement here. Our mission is to create an authentic Christian community that effectively reaches out to unchurched people with love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Why do we say that? Because people need love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And who am I? I'm a people. I need love, acceptance, and forgiveness. I can't just reach out to others with love, acceptance, and forgiveness. I have to love myself. I have to accept myself. I have to forgive myself. In the same way, I'm, I'm in the category of people. If someone else shared with you their thoughts or their feelings, one of the things you might say to them is, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> but when you share your thoughts and feelings, your self-talk is, what are you talking about? When you should be saying to yourself, thank you for sharing that. You love your neighbor. Love yourself. You have to take care of yourself. You have to love yourself. Why? Well, first, I think because you are made in God's image. This is the Bible's first defining word about who you are. When God took that dirt and, and He fashioned it and He breathed life into it and He created us, it says He created us in His image. You may have heard the words, God don't make no junk. You are God's image on this planet. There is no other being other than God more amazing in the universe than you. <laughs> you are the highest of His creation. You look out through the Hubble telescope and you see these galaxies upon galaxies. And, and as one person said to me, man, it makes you realize how insignificant you are. And I said, no, no, no. It makes you realize how significant you are. This is the amazing setting for you. Do you get this? I mean, do you understand how vital, how critical, what supreme value you have? Second, I think we need to feel this way about ourselves because God loves us. And, and He doesn't love what you do for Him. He doesn't love what you're becoming. He loves you. We, we're told by society that we need to be more attractive, we need to be more successful, more popular to be loved. But we know as Christians... That God has already had enough love for us to die for us. We don't need to do anything. He already did it. And if God loves me, who am I to disagree? Who am I to say, well, God, that's your feelings on this subject. I have a different feeling. You know, we've been created by God. God has declared us worthy of love. I have three kids. They're all almost grown. And I remember when they were little, and I remember just going in by their beds at night and, and watching them. Kind of creepy, a little bit, but hang with me here. You know, as, as a dad, as a mom, you, you sit there by their bed and you watch their little chest go up and down, you know, as they're breathing, you know. And you just love them. In that moment, they're not doing anything for you. Why do I love them? Because I created them. Why do I love them? Because I'm their dad. Why do I love them? Because they're my kid. You know, God has that same feeling about you. He loves you. He loves everything about you. He enjoys just watching you be you. That's how God feels. And because God is so generous in giving us this abundant love, we can be so generous in giving this abundant love to others. And then third, you know, God believes in you. He has so much confidence in us that He gives us His Spirit as a deposit 
as our counselor, as our helper. God has invested his all in us, and he has no other plan. There's no plan B. It's us. There's this singing group that, that I like called Pentatonics. It's a five-person group, four guys, one gal. They, they, they're vocal percussionists. They, everything they do, they have no backup instruments, but they make all the noises uh, from their mouths. It, it's an amazing group of people. And, and they just had a, a new song that came out. It's a mashup of two songs. One of the, one of the songs is, Who's Gonna Save the World Tonight? And the other song is, don't worry, child, God has a plan for you. And one is the question, the other is the answer. It's a beautiful song, but it's basically, who's going to save the world tonight? Don't worry, God has a plan for you. You're the answer to that question. I mean, do you understand how much God believes in you? How much trust he is, he is putting in you? How he's going to bring heaven to earth through you. And really, by bringing heaven into it, it reminds us there are three different levels on which we can live our lives. And we'll all have these choices this coming year. The first is the survival level. Survival level, our focus is on ourself. Our question is, how do I get by in life? Many people, most people in the world are on this level. Most people in the world, literally, physically, are on this level. They're just asking, am I going to get to my next meal? They're just asking, am I going to have a roof over my head? They're just asking, can I get to the next week? In fact, if you have coins, like we've been collecting pennies here, and it just shows how wealthy we are. (laughs) Do you realize that if you have two pennies that you can rub together, I'm not talking about a bank account. I'm just talking about two coins. This puts you in 4%, top 4% of the world's population right now. Just having a couple coins. In America, we don't understand, although even in America, we're kind of on the survival level, at least emotional survival. We're we're just trying to get there. We're just trying to hold on. This is the lowest level of living. Beyond that is the success level. Here our focus might be on others, how, how I compare to others. In America, we have an enormous emphasis on success, but this goes way back. In John chapter 21, Jesus had revealed that one of them would betray him. And the disciples went into a, a, a little fury there. Who is it? And Jesus finally calmed them down and said, don't worry about that. Just follow me. There is something in us that wants to compare ourselves to other people and get caught up in all that. And Jesus said, don't do that. But this is an impulse. And, and in America, you know, there are people who are striving trying to to get a leg up, be a little more popular, a little more successful, a little more well-known. And and I've talked to so many people who've said to me, Dave, I'm successful, but why do I feel like a fake? Dave, I got stuff, but I'm so empty. And the truth is, you were made for more than success. You You were made for meaning. You were made for purpose, not to live on something, to live for something. And that leads us to the ultimate level of life, the significance level. In the survival level, our focus is on ourselves, just how do I make it, how do I survive? In the success level, our focus is on others, how do I compare? When we get to the significance level, our focus is on Jesus. And the question is, how can I do God's will? This is the ultimate expression of life. It's the prayer that's prayed in Psalm 143.10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. It's the exhortation that's given to us in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is life from a higher plane. And I think some things go together here. I don't know if we can live on that higher plane if we don't truly understand who we are. If we don't truly understand how loved we are. It's precisely when we doubt our own value and worth that we need 
to accumulate stuff to make us feel okay. It's when we cannot appreciate our own worth that we are driven to measure our worth by the number or the kind of cars in our driveway or the square footage of our home or the type of salary we take. We, we start to measure ourselves by how many rings are on our fingers, how many bells are on our toes. It's when we begin to doubt our own specialness that we feel the need to boast about our accomplishments. See me, look at me, because we're not sure we're worth very much. And so we need to move from success to significance. And significance is when you know the purposes of life and you begin to fulfill them. Purposes like to know God, to grow in God, to go with God. I think your significance becomes clear when first you accept that God has a plan. When you accept that God has a program, that there is something going on. Second, when you understand your role in God's plan, that God's program includes you. You're an important part of it. And then third, when you carry out your role in God's plan. You know he's got a plan, you know you have a role in it, and you enter into that. That's where the significance comes. I think of the last part of our mission statement where we start out by saying we want to create an authentic Christian community that effectively reaches out to unchurched people with love, acceptance, and forgiveness so that they may experience the joy of salvation and a purposeful life of discipleship in that order. I think that order is so telling. First, we've got to experience the joy, the joy of salvation. Then, a purposeful life of discipleship. But we've got to be merry before we're Martha. If you just run out there trying to serve God, and you don't have this joy that just comes from relationship with God, you'll be back where you started. Trying to accumulate, trying to make importance. And the real importance comes from the relationship. It comes from Jesus. So to the golden rule, I'd like to add for 2013 the Jesus rule. The golden rule said treat others as you would like to be treated. The Jesus rule says treat others as if they were Jesus. This comes to me from a story of an old monastery that had kind of fallen on hard times. It had once been a great monastery with many monks, but it was down to like five people left in this grand monastery. And they began to be concerned that maybe they would become defunct. And so one of the monks journeyed out and met with a rabbi in a nearby town and and told them about the dilemma, the demise of the, of the monastery, and, and asked this rabbi, do you have any ideas for us? Do you have any things that you think that, that we could do? And, and the rabbi said, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any advice for you. The only thing I can tell you is that the Messiah is one of you. And so the monk went back to the other four and, and he gave this report. He didn't have much advice for us, but he said that the Messiah is one of us. And they took it literally. They started to behave towards each other as if one of them were Jesus. And, as you might predict, the love that they began to show to each other was so attractive that it, it drew others to the monastery. When you see people the right way, you begin to feel about them the right way. You begin to treat them the right way. And here's my point today. See yourself the right way. Get your thoughts about you lined up with God's thoughts about you. You are Jesus to this world. So love yourself. Let's bow for prayer.